Father God, we, uh, we love this country, and we know that you love this country and that you have created this nation and these people uh, for your own glory. So, our God, our hearts are heavy, and we ask that you would, um, your presence and your sovereignty over this nation would be evident during this time. God, we pray for the Thai leaders, the, the Thailand Protestant Church's Coordinating Committee, and uh, the different organizations here that work together on the national plan. I pray in the, the Evangelical Fellowship of Thailand, the Church of Christ in Thailand, the Thailand uh, Baptist Convention. Pray for the leaders of these organizations that you would give them wisdom in how to lead uh, your people through this time of mourning. God, we, uh, we thank you that you are eternal God, that you are the King of kings. And so, Father, we pray that you would bless this nation and that you would use us to, to bless this nation, Father, for your glory and for the good of your people. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. You know, life is short. I think I've realized that um, this year more than than ever. I think my uh, a, a really good friend of mine passed away in, in um, April. He was the head of the Thailand National Planning Committee, and he passed away then. And uh, wow, I feel like the nation's lost. He was probably the most influential leader in the nation that the Thai uh, Church knew, and so. Um, even the, the de- denominations and different people are wondering, okay, where do we go from here with the national plan in, in the country? And now the king has passed away. But I believe we can be sure of God's sovereignty. And, and we want to live every day to the fullest and make the most of these, these short days we have on earth. I used to think, wow, 50, 50 years old is, a, is old. Now I think, hey, it's pretty young, you know. And I think, you know, days just go by like this and years. And so we want to live a life that is full and meaningful. Jesus said that he had come, he has come that we might have life, have it to abundantly or to the fullest, full and meaningful life. So how do we do that? Doesn't mean that we'd never have any sicknesses. It doesn't mean that we have... Uh, We don't have problems, but I do think that when people look at our lives, there should be something distinctively different about our lives than those who do not follow Jesus Christ. Even in mourning, uh, in in difficult things that we're dealing with with in our life, you know, I wonder sometimes I think the Thais see me and they say, well, you know, he prays, well, I chant. He goes to church, I go to the temple, Um, he gives offerings, I I make merit, you know, I give offerings. What is it that makes us as believers distinctively different? And I don't want to hear from people, oh, well, every religion teaches man to be good. They're all the same. That's not what we want people to to, uh, to say when they look at our lives. When they look at me, I don't want people to say that. And that's, that's not why I want to live a, an abundant life so that just so others can see it. I, I believe we all here are here today because we want to live lives that are pleasing to God. That is our ultimate motivation, motivation to please God with our lives. And not only that, to, to, to enjoy that and experience that abundant life that God has promised to us. So how do we do that? You know, we're, it's exciting as we're going through the entire Bible to look at history and how God has worked throughout history. And you can kind of divide all of history into four big events. You can say creation, fall, redemption, and restoration. And that's kind of how all of history is moving. God created the world. He, man fell into sin. He redeemed us from our sin. And now he is restoring us and he's restoring all things where we are in our in our journey through scripture is we're we're in the fall part we we are still in the fall part i believe but um 
we live with the effects of the fall, but now that Jesus has come, we are living in the restoration time of history where God is restoring us. And so as we look back on the Old Testament, and we, it's been exciting to see how God has worked. And the, the neat thing about God's word is that this is not just history, you know, 2,000, 4,000 years ago. But God said in 1 Corinthians 10, he said that he allowed these things to happen to Israel as an example for us. And so when we look at Scripture in the Old Testament, we're not just reading history. We are, um, God is speaking to us through history and through his word to show us how we should live our lives each day. So as we have gone through Scripture, I want us to take a look, just kind of a summary of where we've been here. So, um, yeah, I've got a lot here. So God created the earth. Next is, then after that, we see the timeline we've been going through here at BCF. God created Adam and Eve, and that's about 4,000 B.C., uh, according to Scripture. And then from there, we have Noah and the flood. That was about 3,000 B.C. On from there was God chose Abram or Abraham about 2,000 years B.C. And then God, uh, uh, from Abraham, there was Isaac. And then Isaac had two sons, uh, Jacob and Esau. And God chose Jacob and changed his name to Israel, the Israel that we know today. And then God led the people through Joseph into Egypt for slavery for f- about 400 years. And then after 400 years, as, as Alan was sharing just, just now, the history continues where we've been so far through Scripture, is that Moses led the people out of Egypt through the Red Sea, through that what looked like a barrier became a miracle. And then God gives the law. And here's where I want us to... to take up today okay we god gave the law and it took them go into the next slide there it took them just 41 days to go from uh, egypt all the way down to mount sinai and mount sinai another word or name for mount sinai is mount mount horeb so 41 days they came out they journeyed down there and then god gave them a law the law and then from there they actually stayed in that area around Mount Sinai about two years, about two years just uh, listening to God, understanding the law, how to, how to function as a new nation, as, a, as a na- the nation of Israel, how, how a sh- society should work with the laws and, uh, that govern the people. And then from there, God led them to Kadesh, Barnea, or Kadesh Barnea, Barnea, however you want to say it, Kadesh Barnea. And, and they came to this place, and this is where we're going to start today. Uh, if you'll see from there, one more slide. And then we ultimately, they enter into the promised land. So where we're going to take up today uh, is right on the edge of the promised land. If you'll go to the next slide there, here's the map. So they come out of, out of Egypt there in the top left-hand corner, and they go down the peninsula there, the Sinai P- Peninsula, and they p- stay there for a couple of years. And then they make their way up, and they end up there about in the middle, a little to the right of the middle, that uh, Kadesh Barnea. And they were there on the edge of the Promised Land. And so this is what I want us to look at today in this place Kadesh Barnea, what happened there and how that relates to our life and how we live this abundant life that God has, asked, has promised to us. So I want to just look in, in the book of Deuteronomy just to kind of set us up for what Deuteronomy is. Uh, Deuteronomy means a, a second uh, a reiteration of the law. So they had, this is when they had actually come back to the edge of Jordan where where, um, they were about to enter into the promised land for the the second time. And so so if you uh, read with me here, it says, These are the words that Moses spoke to all of Israel, all Israel beyond the Jordan in the wilderness in 
Arabah, opposite Shuf, between Paran and Tophel, Laban, Harazoth, and Dizara. Wow, all those big Dizahab, Diz, Dizabab, something like that, yeah. It is 11 days' journey from Horeb by the way of Mount Seir to Kadesh, Kadesh Barnea. In the 40th year, on the first day of the 11th month, Moses spoke to the people of Israel according to all that the Lord had given him in, command, in commandment to them. This is where I want us to kind of camp out today, is right here in Deuteronomy chapter 1. So they had spent this 40 years in the wilderness, and now they're back. And so Moses is just kind of giving a summary of what has happened in the last 40 years. And he, he, he kind of gives a series of sermons in this whole book, kind of reiterating, reminding them of the law, what God had done and what they had done in disobedience. And now they're about to go into the promised land. So look at that, what it says there, how far it actually was from Mount Sinai on the bottom of the peninsula to it says it is 11 days journey from Horeb by the way of Mount Seir to Kadesh Barnea 11 days from the bottom all the way up to where they were supposed to go in and then they stayed there at Kadesh Barnea go to the next slide uh, let's go back here so we have 40 to, they stay there two years keep going they 41 days to, to get the law on Mount Sinai, and then they stay there two years. Next, And then they actually, it says, go to the next slide. It was 11 days' journey from the bottom to the top there. And then what happened? Because they rejected God, they were in the wilderness for the next there. It says 38 years they continued in the wilderness. And then finally... They make it to the promised land. You can hit it again there. So go to the next slide again. Look at this again. Click it there. That's where they were the first time. And then 11 days journey from the bottom to the top there. 11 days. They're so close. They are so close to getting all that God had promised them for hundreds of years. From Abraham's time, God promised them this land, and they're just 11 days away from it after they get the law, and they make their way up there, and then they're just right on the edge, maybe a day's journey. They say there's a mountain between uh, Kadesh Barnea to the promised land there, and then you remember they sent the spies in. They said, well, God said, go and take the land, and they said, well, let's, let's send some spies in to check it out first. They send the 12 spies in. J, uh, Joshua and Caleb came back, and they were the only ones that gave the good report that, hey, you know, we should go take it. All the other ten guys said, it's beautiful. There's abundant fruit there. It is, it is a land flowing with milk and honey, but the people are huge. We're going to get killed. We're going to get clobbered. We can't believe now. Again, God has led us to an unbelievable, uh, difficult place that our lives are threatened. And you kind of see this, this theme going through Israel. They just continue to kind of complain. They continue to kind of doubt what God has said to them. And so you kind of think, what, what in the world happened to them? Why did they not just go in and take it? God had told them. He led them right through the Red Sea just like he... Uh, he, he didn't even tell him he was going to do that. He just did it. Now he's told him, I'm going to give you this land. Go in and take it. This is the promised land. And, and then they didn't. So why, what makes them say no? What's them, what's, what turns them away? I'll read a, a couple of passages for you. Over in, in chapter 1, verse 20, 21, it says, See, the Lord has set the, land, has set the land before you. Go up, take possession as the Lord, the God of your fathers, has told you. Do not fear or be dismayed. So God tells them, go and take it. Now, 
Moses is just telling the people what has happened 38 years before that. So Moses is telling or reminding them here. But then, what did they do? And so um, they'd sent the spies in, but then, then Moses says to them again, he says, Then I said to you, do not be in dread or afraid of them. The Lord your God who goes before you will himself fight for you, just as he did for you in Egypt before your eyes and in the wilderness, where you have seen how the Lord your God carried you as a man carries his son all the way that you went until you came to this place. God had carried them through the wilderness for a couple of years, prepared them, had given them their law, his, his law, and now they can't do it. They can't do it. They just are afraid. And so we're going to look at what are those obstacles um, that keep that kept them from moving into the promised land. And we're going to look at it for us as well. What are the obstacles that keep us in walking in the fullness and receiving all that God has for us? Does that make sense? Okay, so we're going to look at what happened to them and say, how does this apply to us today? First of all, I want to ask, you know, what is the promised land? You know, you can interpret this because all these things are symbolic they're real events that happen, but they're also lessons and principles for us. What is the promised land? You know, um, you could say it, it, it is an actual place. And that's why we see on the news every day um, people fighting over this piece, little piece of land called Israel, the Arabs and the, the, the Jewish people, and it's even divided up into quadrants. You know, you have the Christian quarter and the Armenian quarter, the Muslim quarter, and, and you've got the Muslim, the temple of uh, the rock, dome of the rock right there where the temple mount was. They're still fighting over this geographical piece of land. So that is one literal interpretation, which is true, because they are still fighting over this. Another way you could say, what is the promised land? What is the promised land? You could say it is heaven. And it's, you know, you've, we've heard the songs, you know, well, he's crossed over. We, when we cross over Jordan and we enter in heaven, into heaven. And I think um, symbolically that, that, is, uh, that is true. I think um, when we enter into heaven, that is the ultimate promised land to be with God. But even th- this analogy doesn't really work out because when, when the children of Israel went into to, um, to Canaan, the promised land, they had to drive out, you know, their enemies, slowly take over the land. And that's, that doesn't really, that's not going to happen in heaven. Everything's going to be perfect. And so it's not, it can be considered heaven. And, but generally that's a songbook theology, not necessarily, it doesn't say that in the Bible that that, that the promised land is heaven somewhere out there. Another way of looking at what the promised land is, is It is salvation for us when we come to know the Lord. Um, some people would say, well, uh, another scripture says that people were baptized uh, when they crossed through the, the, crossed through the Red Sea. Uh, there was a baptism, it says in scripture, that kind of took place, a symbolic of baptism. But it does say that these people did not enter in to the promised land. So if it was true salvation which we cannot lose our salvation, we know that that is not uh, necessarily the, uh, the meaning of it there, that you, uh, the people that, uh, that died did not believe God, and so they didn't enter in. So the baptism usually comes after, right? You, get bapt- you become a Christian, not before. So that, but that's a way of looking at it as well. And we know Moses, we know Moses is a believer, and even though he did not enter into the promised land, it's not necessarily uh, our salvation. But there are pictures here, part of this promised land analogy we can look at in our own life today and say, yes, when we, when we come to know God, when we come to know God, he takes control of our heart. And there is a, a driving out of the sin in our life by his spirit. He allows, he gives, he empowers us. We, we taste and see who God is, and he 
um, empowers us to drive out the sin in our life that keep us from experiencing all that God has for us. So what is the promised land? Well, there's, there's different ways you can look at it, as I was saying. We'll come right back to that one more in just a moment. But I want us to look at, go to the next slide. Sorry there. What I want us to look at is these are pictures of the the wilderness, the Sinai Peninsula. One's a satellite picture. One is kind of on the ground. If you've ever flown over the Middle East, which I'd never done that until earlier this year, I flew over Abu Dhabi. And you look down, it's just like, sand everywhere you're like this is barren desert dry there's not a lot of growth there this is what the wilderness looks like and then uh, go ahead to the next slide there this is what the promised land looks like this is the sea of galilee and you can see the green you see the flowers and you see god called it a land flowing with milk and honey which means there's vegetation there and there's the, as the bees make the honey from the, the plants that are growing, it's not a barren land. And you see the cattle and sheep and flocks are able to be reared there. So the, it was a prosperous place for the children of Israel as they moved into that. And so what I want to ask you is where do you feel like you are today? Do you feel like your life feels like you're in a barren place? Or do you feel like you're experiencing the promised land that God has promised us? Jesus said, come that you might have life and have it more abundantly. If you look at these pictures and you say, what, which of these pictures really reflect how I feel right now about my life as a Christian? You know, I, I don't like in, in tied, you've seen that little um, uh, devotional book called The Daily Bread. The Daily Bread, it's... Um, which is, a, which is a good, you know, word to call the daily bread. But in Thai, they translated the daily manna. Daily manna prachamwan is what they call it. Daily manna. Which I can't stand that name because what it implies is that every day we kind of get up and we get our Bible and we go out and collect our same old, same old manna. And we just kind of eat it and just kind of make our way through this wilderness of life, barren, dry, suffering. And I don't think that's the way God intended us to live. I don't think God intended us to live with a sense of dryness and barrenness and struggle all the time. I think he wants us to experience this, the fullness of his life, which we could say is the promised land. But we often don't do that because we're like the children of Israel and we we come to a a decision in our life and we, we hit certain things and we say, well, I'm not sure I want to, I want to do that. I know God is speaking to me now, but I'm not really sure that that's what I want right now. I'm not, I'm kind of afraid of this. So what are those obstacles in our life that keep us from stepping into the promised land? Go to the next slide. As I said, there's a mountain area right between Kadesh Barnea and the promised land. And so I want us to ask, what are those mountains in your life? Has God asked you to step into something that you're not comfortable with? Maybe if you're not a believer, initially it is that trusting in Christ to save us from our sin. And that's, for many people, a very fearful thing. How, what are my, what's my family going to think? What am I going to do about my, uh, in my culture? How am I going to, to explain this to other people? Will God really um, take care of me? Will I have to leave my friends? What's, what's going to happen? If you're not a believer yet, this is a point of decision. And I would say that is what Kadesh Barnea is for us. It is a point of decision, first in our salvation, in getting to know God, but even 
More than that, it is a daily decision of how we experience God at work in our life. So let's see what, what it says about the people there. As, they, as I read just now, it says, Moses said, Then I said to you, I'll, I'll read this again, Do not be in dread or afraid of them. The Lord your God who goes before you will himself fight for you, just as he did for you in Egypt before your eyes and in the wilderness where you have seen how the Lord your God carried you as a man carries his son all the way you went until you came to this place. Yet, listen to this, yet in spite of this word, you did not believe the Lord your God who went before you in the way to seek you out a place to pitch your tents in fire by night and in the cloud by day to show you by what way you should go. Later in the chapter there, it says that they rebelled against God. So what are those obstacles that keep us? Go ahead with the the slide there. Fear. Many times it really is fear. Now, were the children of Israel really afraid when they, when they went in and surveyed? Yes. Fear is a, is a very real thing for us. We, we, um, we encounter it almost every day. God asks us to do something or just something happens in our life. I'm sure the nation of Thailand is, is very fearful. What's going to happen in our country now? What's going to happen now that the king is no more here? What are we going to do? Who's going to take over power and what will it look like? What will our nation look like? I think for us as believers, we do the same thing. When God asks us to do something, to step out in a point of decision, a lot of times we're genuinely afraid. So what would that be like? It may not be something very big. It may just be, I want you to go say your sorry to this person you've hurt and how do you feel how do we feel when we know we've done something wrong we know we need to go apologize to someone we kind of feel well i don't i'm kind of afraid to do that or i'm I'm not i don't feel comfortable doing that or maybe god says i want you to go uh, share with this person about jesus Wow, okay, that ramps it up a little bit. I'm, I'm kind of afraid. What are they going to, it's going to be awkward. I know they're going to feel uncomfortable. So fear is something that's real in our life. Go to the next one. What's another? Just unbelief. Unbelief, well, I don't really believe that God's going to do anything in this situation. I don't, I'm not going to do it. The same as the children of Israel. They looked at the promised land. They said, I just can't believe it. I just can't believe God's going to defeat this huge army on the other side of this mountain here as he said he would. But look what they'd, what they'd been through. They had all these miracles. God fed them in the desert. God uh, parted the sea for them. He gave water out of a rock. And I don't know about you, but my life, I can look back at my life And I can see over and over again how God answered prayer. And he took me to a better place because he empowered me to obey him and step out, move a little bit farther in my walk with him. Every step, God has proven himself faithful. But every day, I think when I'm when I get to a point of decision about what God wants me to do in my life. There's a hesitancy. A kind of, well, is that right? What's, what's another one? Uh, the next slide there, Charles. It may just be stubbornness, selfishness. I don't know about you, but I just really, I get comfortable and I say, you know, I just don't want to do that. I just don't feel comfortable doing that. And our, I'd rather not go there with that person. I'd rather not go apologize. I'd rather not give money to this situation. Sometimes just my own stubbornness or my own selfishness. Uh, The 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 Old Testament calls the people of Israel, you know what you remember what they call them? Stiff necked people. And someone said, well, you know, I guess they they kind of needed a Thai massage to kind of get their neck loosened up to be able to respond 
to God, to step out and to respond to over that stubbornness, that self. The next one may be just uh, the next slide there, just doubt. You know, well, did God really tell me to do that? Is that really, you know, have you ever done that to yourself? God asks you to do something and you kind of go back and forth, kind of questioning. Is that what really God wants me to do? You know, maybe I didn't hear God real clearly on that. Does he really want me to step out? Does he really want me to share? And so you kind of go back and forth in your mind on something that God has spoken to you. But all these things, what does God call it? The next slide, he calls it disobedience. Disobedience. So it says that they rebelled against God. Were they fearful? Yeah. They were fearful. Did they question God? Yes. Were they not believing in God? God calls it disobedience or rebellion against him. And so because of that, they spent that whole generation of people died off because they disobeyed God and they didn't embrace all that God had for them. So I want to ask you again, when you looked at those pictures of the promised land and the, um, the desert, the wilderness, where do you feel like you are in your walk with God today? Do you feel uh, that you are walking in all that God has for you? Or do you feel like you're in the wilderness? I do want to say there are times in our life that we go through a wilderness time that we didn't bring on ourselves. These people obviously brought it on themselves, right? They rejected God. But I do believe there are times in our life that we are in a, in a desert time, that God leads us through something difficult, that we feel like we can't hear God, we can't feel God, we don't see Him at work. And so there are times that God does test us, that there are wilderness times. But I don't think that should be the trend of our entire life. Some people may be struggling with depression or different things like that. I don't think every time we're in the wilderness, a wilderness experience, that we are in sin. But I know for me personally, most of the time, it's because I have said no to God on something. That I have said, I just don't want to do that. Or I'm not ready to do that. Or I don't have time to do that. Or just don't want to. So I don't know where you are in your life today, but I want to suggest that the promised land itself is Jesus walking in the fullness of who Jesus is and his spirit and how he's empowered us. He himself is the promised land. And as we walk with him in the promised land, do we experience uh, the fullness that he has for us. I think about the the Old Testament. You see this over and over again. People who made the wrong decisions, people made the right decisions. I think about the book of Esther. And you remember Haman had kind of put out this this law that the the, the people there could kill all the, the Jewish people. And Esther, here she is a queen. I, I don't remember if they... they um, They knew she was a Jew, but she was probably not going to be killed with the rest of them. But they came to her and said, you know, you have to appeal to the king. This is not a good law. Your people are going to die. And she asked everyone to fast. And then she put her own life at risk in going before the king without getting permission. She could be killed. But she said, if I perish, I perish. And she stepped out. And what it did it released blessing to her whole nation. She saved a whole people there because she was willing to step out and trust that God would make a way for her people. I um, guess to give an example, just a, uh, a modern day example. My wife, she's not in here. I'll just use her. I think uh, you know we those of us who've come as missionaries. I think is uh, it's a it's a big step. I think of my wife, when she came over initially in 96, she was going, uh, going through the book of Esther, and she felt um, 
all of her roommates were like, oh, I can't wait to get home. And she was like, I don't know why. I just feel like I like it here. I feel like God's calling me here. And she went back to the States, and we weren't. she was actually dating another guy. So she didn't come for me. But I was in, we were in the same group, and I liked her a little bit, but I thought, there's no way. I'm 12 years older than her, and she's not coming back here probably, like most people don't. And she went back, and she started praying, and she and her boyfriend stopped dating, and that call in her heart just continued to rise up. And she said that we needed a, uh, a person to come over as a teacher to the missionary kids. She was going to move to the northeast of Thailand to Khon Ken and set up a little one-room schoolhouse for three or four missionary kids. And she said, God wants me to do that. I want to do that. So, you know, if you're a missionary, you have to raise support. Here she was, 23-year-old who raised support, left her mom and dad, came to the other side of the world to teach missionary kids. And what happened? Those families were blessed. I was blessed immensely because she stepped out in faith and said, okay, I'm going to the other side of the world to just help these little kids. She wasn't even coming necessarily for the ties. She was coming to help alongside the other people. So I think I don't know where you are today. What What is it in your life that you feel like God has put before you and said, I want you to do this? Maybe it's a, a dream, that he, uh, a kind of ministry that you, he wants you to do. Maybe it's write a book. Maybe it's um, go share with your next door neighbor. Maybe it's something at work that you really feel like God's put on your heart and you think, I just don't want to do that but I know I need to do it. What I feel that this lesson is for us is if you want to taste and see that the Lord is good, if you want to taste of the milk and the honey of the promised land, the promised land, tasting that of who Jesus is, is stepping out in obedience to what God wants you to do today. That's what it is. Ultimately, as we experience the promised land here on earth, just a taste of it, every time you step out, every time you say yes to Jesus, you are experiencing his life. I think about when Jesus was there and all the other disciples went to get lunch, you know, and he's there at the well and uh, he shares the gospel with that woman at the well and they come back and they say, Jesus, you want some lunch? And he's like, I've already eaten. And they're like, where did Jesus get lunch at? You know, where did he get his food? We just went to buy some food, and he's full. He said, my food is to do the will of God, of of my Father. How does it make you feel when you obey and you do what God asks you to do, even if it doesn't turn out the way you think it should turn out? You taste and you see that God is good. And you, your soul is nourished. Your spirit is nourished because you have tasted and you've taken one more step into the promised land in that journey with Jesus. He himself, walking in his spirit, is the promised land. It's not somewhere out there. We can taste just a bit of what God wants us to have every day of our life if we'll say yes to him. And you, we see it, you know, in, in the life of Esther. You see it in the life of uh, how uh, life of Paul, how he stepped out. And, uh, but ultimately, we, we, we see our ultimate example in Jesus Christ. As he was in the Garden of Gethsemane, and he knew God was leading him to the cross. He said, not my will, but your will be done. And he stepped in to the most painful thing that you can imagine. But then God lifted up his name to be the name above every name because he obeyed. So he is our ultimate example of what it means to walk in obedience. You know, you wonder why why, um, didn't Moses, I always think that's a harsh, Leslie preached on it a couple of, weeks ago, you know, it seems so harsh that 
Moses had been in the desert herding sheep for 40 years, and then he's herding people for another 40 years, and then he strikes the rock again, and, and God doesn't let him go into the promised land. I always thought that's, a, that's very harsh, but in God's plan, you know, the name Joshua, the one who ultimately led them into the promised land, is the Hebrew name for Jesus. Moses, all that he represented was the law, all the laws that God, and the law is good, but it will never get us into heaven. It will never make us right with God. Only Jesus, the Lord saves, is the name of the meaning of Jesus and Joshua. Jesus himself is the fulfillment of that promised land in our life. So go to the next slide there. I don't know where you are in your life with God or what God wants you to do, but I just want to encourage you to put your trust in God, whether if you've never done that before, if you say, I really have never tasted, I want you to to open your heart to God, and, and you can talk to me or anyone, uh, Alan here after church, if you'd like to pray and accept Jesus Christ for the first time in your life. But if, if you're just a believer and you feel like every day is kind of like going out and reading my Bible, collecting the daily manna, and I'm just wandering, I'm just kind of enduring here on earth until I go to the ultimate promised land, I want to challenge that today and say, ask God, what is it? in your life that maybe you've held back from God, that you haven't said, okay, God, I will step out in obedience in spite of my fear, in spite of even my doubt, in spite of my own stubbornness and selfishness and unbelief. God, I want to step out and I want to experience the life that you have for us. This verse says, let's read this again. For truly, I say to you, If you have faith like a grain of mustard seed, you will say to this mountain, move from here to there, and it will move, and nothing will be impossible for you. These are the words of Jesus. Let's take a moment and pray together now. Father God, I uh, just thank you for this incredible story of what you have done with the the children of Israel, God. And we see... One generation's lack of belief. And then we see the the new generation who stepped out in faith with Joshua. With you going before them as their commander. Taking them in to taste of the milk and the honey. The pure nourishment and sweetness that you provide provided for them in that physical land at that time. God, I pray for each of us today that we would not walk in a wilderness of unbelief or doubt. God, that, but that by your spirit, Father, that we would trust in you and that we would step out to do whatever it is that you have called each of us to do. God, we thank you for the Lord Jesus and his example to us. And God, we thank you for that ultimate promised land that one day we will experience together. We will gather around your throne and lift up your name in worship because you are Lord of lords and King of kings take just a moment right now and just listen to God. See how he would speak to you about one thing that you need to do maybe today or this week or this month or this year. Maybe with your spouse. Maybe with your children. Maybe at your work. Just listen to God just for a moment.
God, we want to hear your voice. And God, we are so distracted of a people. God, we pray now that you would empower us by your spirit to hear your voice and to obey. And that we would taste and see that you are good. And all that you have promised us is in your son, Jesus Christ. You have given us everything we need for life and godliness through your great and precious promises. So we commit ourselves to you today again, God, and ask as we go out that we would be a light in this community, in this city where the people are mourning now, Father. I pray that you would use us to comfort them, to speak words of grace and truth to them, Father, to let them know who you are. God, we thank you uh, again for today. I pray that we would walk in the fullness of all that you have for us. In Jesus' name, amen.